One of the benefits of this formal computer simulation modeling approach is that it allows us to kind of like correct our own human intuition, our own human reasoning, which is often very faulty. Our intuition leads us astray a lot of times. And these why formal models, also computer supported models, are very good in, in sticking to our assumptions and make sure that our human intuition doesn't leave us astray. So let's look at one very concrete uh, example from one kind of computer simulation modeling approach. It's called agent-based modeling. That's a bottom-up modeling approach. And let's look at a, one very famous model, a Nobel Prize winning model, Schelling's segregation model. Uh, Professor Schelling was always very interested in the question and the observation that if you look at modern cities, usually you can see a lot of segregation between different segments of society. So you can see a neighborhood of black and white people, then you can see, uh, for example, different religious congregations over here and over here, different cultural uh, belongings, ethnic belongings here and there. And, and you can see the USC Trojans here and the UCLA Bruins over here. You know, so a lot of segregation is going on in cities if, if you really look at it. Now, the interesting thing that Professor Schelling observed is that once you ask people, they say, well, actually, I, I don't like living in a purely white neighborhood. I would love to have a more multicultural setting here in my neighborhood. You know, there are two ways how you can explain these contradictions. Either people are just liars. You know, they just, they really, are, really, they don't do, they really want to live in a white neighborhood or, or there's a little bit more to it. So uh, Professor Schelling said, well, maybe there is more to it. So he invented this kind of model. Check it out. So here we have our grid, our playing grid with red and green citizens. We have 2,400 citizens and we randomly distribute that, them on this grid. And we have the following rule. The citizens say that 50% of my neighbors should be like me. So the red ones say 50% of my neighbors should be red and the green ones say 50% of my neighbors should be green. We can right now see that 42% of them are unhappy. That means for 42% of them, this condition is not given for the rest. It is given and we give them one simple rule. We program the rule here in the code. You can see the code and, and the rule is very simple, it says, if you're unhappy, move to the next free space and then reevaluate your situation if you're happy now. And if you're then not happy, move to the next free space and reevaluate your situation. So then we get going and that's all we do. We program and we set up the game and we say go. We see here the ticks are the time periods that pass and every time period people are re-evaluating. We see the unhappiness is going down very quickly. So people, they are ever more happier. That means they fulfill the criteria that 50% of the neighbors are like them. But what happens to the level of similarity, to the level of segregation? You can see an extreme level of segregation sitting in, setting in. So you see here that 85% of the red ones are next to red ones and 85% of the green ones are next to the green ones. The, the micro motive, the motivation at the individual level was 50%, but the macro pattern that emerges out of this collective dynamic is a much more segregated society. And now that we reach equilibrium that everybody is now eventually happy, uh, we can see, well, we have a very segregated society. Now nothing happens, nothing moves anymore. Everybody is happy. Well, maybe it was just bad luck. So let's do that again. We randomly toss them again on our grid. We have 50% similarity at the beginning. We can do that several times. We get every time a little bit different initial conditions. And the unhappiness level always around 42%. So we can do that again. And, and then we can see, okay, Let's start, we let our agents move around, time passes here, the ticks go by. And when everybody is happy, we reach equilibrium again, 88% similarity. Let's do that again, let's see what happens. And this result, again, 88%, always a little different, it depends on the initial conditions. But in general, we find 50% on the individual level, and we get a result over 85% on the macro level of segregation. So let's change our conditions a little bit. Let's say our people, they're much more tolerant. They now say, look, we only want 26% of our neighbors to be like us. So almost like three in four neighbors can be different to me, just 
a little bit more than one in, in our four neighbors should be like me. We set up the entire game. We see now here that people are much less unhappy because just by randomly distributing them on the on the on, on our grid, while well, they are much more tolerant, so less of them are unhappy. And let's see what happens. If we now set go, you can see they look. The unhappiness is going down very quickly. They look for a location where they can achieve happiness and we can see the level of segregation goes up here to well almost 70 percent or does it reach 70 percent when everybody is happy we have a level of segregation of 70 percent that's better than before but look we aimed at 26 so on the individual level these people have been extremely tolerant and they end up in a quite segregated society at 70 percent let's do that again to see what we get um again we start like this and we get a result again 69 percent Let's do that again, just to make sure. Initial conditions always vary, vary a little bit. Again, 67%, that's what we get. Now let's just change our micro motives uh, by 1%. So from 26%, I go down to 25%. I just changed it by 1%. Now really, they say, well, one in my, uh, one in my four neighbors should be like me. And let's see what happens. We start the setup and we go. People move around, and now we achieve a level of segregation of 56%. That means we just changed 1% our individual behavior here, and we have a social outcome that is more than 10% different from previously 70%, now down to 56%. Let's do that again just to make sure that wasn't a chance, just a chance event. And again, we get that result. So these, well, this phenomenon has many names, phase transition, nonlinearities, these are kind of tipping points. So just by changing the logic a little bit, you get a big effect on the macro level, on the macro outcome. You can do this on the other side as well now. And we say now these people are much more demanding. They say 75%, three of my four neighbors should be exactly like me. So these people are much more demanding. We have a setup, we see that 88% of them are basically unhappy and we keep running the simulation. Well, unhappiness goes down over time as well. Time passes here and very quickly people, well, they are so demanding. So this is now a fast forward, fast forward version of how quickly they move. Well, unhappiness goes down over time as well. Um, this here actually, this works on a donut. So this side here connects to this side. And this side up here connects to this side. So people move out here and come back in here. You can see this is actually, this is one giant, well, red community that you see here evolving. And now after took a long time, 270 periods, we can see, well, almost complete segregation. You can see actually an, an empty buffer zone here between them. Everybody is happy, but look at the level of segregation, 99.8%. Like reds are only with reds and, and greens are, only with greens. Um, so let's change this here by 1% from 75% to 76%. And guess what happens now? Let's check it out. We press go and what happens? It never finds an equilibrium. I mean, these people are so racist that they are never satisfied. They always search around. But but look at the result. It is the most homo most mixed society that we ever had. The level of similarity is impressively low, 50%. So a bunch of races now suddenly turn out to live in a completely mixed society. Um, and again, we just changed our micro behaviors by only... 1% and had a completely different outcome. This society doesn't settle down on an equilibrium. So this formal model gives us interesting insights that help us to understand aspects where our human intuition, our human reasoning often fails. For example, that the total is different and it's actually more than the sum of its parts. This is often called emergence. So the total is different and more than the sum of its parts. So for example, a bunch of 
actually quite tolerant people ended up in a very segregated society and a bunch of extreme racists ended up in a mixed society. Our human intuition is not very good in detecting these kind of things. And also the formal model allowed us to detect these phase transitions. So phase transitions are what you actually are interested in, what you want to detect. For example, when you do policy. So there is something happening, you can put a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of money into an effort, but then suddenly it tips these tipping points. So, and then suddenly, well, you put in just a little bit more money and then a big effect happens. So you often want to detect these phase transitions just by thinking about them. It's extremely difficult to detect them. Formal model help us. So Schelling's segregation model, as simplistic as it seems, it actually was proven to be empirically correct. So empirical data from Los Angeles, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, Omaha, Kansas City show that the Schelling description of preferences is broadly correct. But the empirical curves are, of course, less regular than the curve suggested by a theoretical model. And you can make the model as complex and as reality truthful as you would like. Usually there are of course more than four neighbors that you're interested in. They're actually networks. Maybe it's the number of people in your expanded neighborhood that you're interested in and into their preferences. You can actually use the digital data footprint and make a model to specific cities. And then it becomes increasingly more complex. So these models allow you to understand very simply what's the logic and that was proven to be correct. And now you can go on and make it as sophisticated as you like. A big benefit of computer simulations is that they allow for an intuitive way to communicate scientific results. So for example, when Professor Schelling, here he is with his Nobel Prize, came up with his theory of segregation model in the 1970s, there were no computers. So actually he did it with a couple of pennies on a chessboard. And he was actually going with pennies on a chessboard back and forth. And he still claims in his book, I cannot too strongly urge you to get the dimes and and pennies and do it yourself. There's nothing like tracing it through for yourself and seeing the thing work it out, it out. In an hour or so, you can do it several times and experiment with different rules of behavior, sizes and shapes of boards. And if you turn some coins and heads and some tails, you can even have subgroups of dimes and pennies and so forth really genius and you need to have a lot of patience for an hour or so to sit there with dimes and pennies and imagine doing all these movements uh, but you also have to be a really big nerd in order to have the patience to do that but he got these very interesting insights that he called micro motives to macro behaviors that's what he got his nobel prize for now but imagine so i was working at the united nations secretariat and i was working with presidents ministers uh, uh, secretaries and policy makers of all different levels now imagine i would sit down and say mr president or even mr mayor could you sit down here with my pennies and, and chessboard and in an hour or so i can show you several times how it works itself they would not sit down with me for an hour or so. You know, it's without computers, it's impossible to communicate this complexity. Well, the other traditional way of communicating this complexity is through mathematical formulas, through summaries of this dynamic. So Schelling also actually worked out these kind of mathematical summaries, as you can see here. And modern microeconomic textbooks also explain Schelling's result with the help of differential equations like this one here. So it says, the equation might be read as follows. The expected fraction of green next period is the fraction of green this period minus any green who exchanged the place with the blue the second term on the right, obviously on the right hand side, plus any blues who change the place with the green, which is the third term. And then you basically take the derivative, you put it to zero, you look for the optimal and voila, Mr. President, Mr. Mayor, I only need a couple of million dollars and we can have a policy that eliminates segregation in your city. They wouldn't give me a couple of million dollars just because nobody can follow that. Nobody can understand that. So the benefit is nowadays with these computer simulations, you can now intuitively communicate extremely complex and completely non-intuitive results, deep insights about the working of the fabric of societies through a very visual intuitive way.